I guess we'll start. Uh, good morning. My name is Eric from Washington State Housing Finance Commission, and I'm here to introduce Dan Emanuel. He's a senior research analyst from the National Low Income Housing Coalition. So give it up to Dan. Hello, everyone. Um, so as you just mentioned, uh, my name is Dan Emanuel. I'm a senior research analyst at the National Low Income Housing Coalition, which is a research and advocacy organization based in Washington, DC, the other Washington. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk a bit about uh, understanding why tech preservation challenges today. And um, a lot of my, my work at the coalition uh, actually centers around uh, something we work on called the National Housing Preservation Database. And uh, so you'll be hearing a lot about that and preservation data today. So I'll start with just kind of an overview for you all. Um, we'll start with uh, kind of just an overview of what preservation is, talk a little bit about LITEX specific preservation risk factors. Then I'll present some estimates or national level estimates that I've done about risk uh, for the tax credit program. And then I'm gonna talk quite a bit about uh, some of the challenges we face in actually producing accurate data around uh, LITEX preservation risk factors. And then we'll finish up with some policy recommendations and a Q&A. But first, I just want to start off by um, posing the question, why should we even be talking about YTEC preservation? Well, I'd, I'd say we should because it's the largest federal housing program. It supports about half of the entire federally assisted housing stock. Um, and the program also reached a very important milestone in 2020. It was the first year that properties started to reach 30 years of service and the end of their federally mandated use restrictions. Um, the tax credit program also serves the lowest income tenants in conjunction with rental assistance. So over half of LIHTC tenants earn 30% uh, or less of the area median income. So there's a, a significant potential uh, for housing instability if affordability isn't preserved in these properties. So, <clears throat> so what's, what is preservation? Well, generally speaking, affordable housing preservation refers to efforts that seek to ensure the continued physical quality and affordability of subsidized housing for tenants. And there are really <clears throat> three different broad types of preservation risk factors that we can, we generally talk about. Um, and these are factors that are associated with the increased likelihood that a federally assisted rental home will be lost from the affordable stock, right? So the first and probably the most obvious one is what we generally call exit risk. And that refers to the ex expiration or termination of affordable housing restrictions. So the affordability requirements and eligibility restrictions that are associated with, with a program, right? Then there's something we generally call depreciation risk, which refers to the declining financial or physical condition of properties. And then, of course, appropriation risk, which is basically the threat of Congress not providing sufficient funding for programs to ensure their continued operation. So now I'm going to turn to some very specific LIHTC preservation risks. Um, so, of course, there's appropriations risk for the LIHTC program, but really, technically, I guess you'd say it's legislative risk because there aren't appropriations for LIHTC. Um, and this threat really consists of um, the fact that the extension or expansion of the tax credit program is contingent on congressional action, right? As is the continued availability of other important subsidies for tax credit properties like project-based uh, rental assistance or vouchers for that matter. And generally speaking, we all know this already, the tax credit program is already oversubscribed. So some properties are not gonna be able to receive subsequent credit tax credit allocations unless Congress takes action to expand the program. And then of course there's a depreciation risk in the tax credit program. Obviously we've hit this 30 year mark, the properties are all getting older and they don't necessarily, they're not guaranteed a secondary or subsequent allocation of tax credits to preserve the property. And generally speaking, I would say the depreciation risks in the tax credit program are probably the most difficult to quantify for us because there's no physical inspection score to indicate the quality of the physical quality of the property unless there's already another HUD multifamily subsidy present, which would, you know, something like Section 8 uh, contract would give you a REAC score. And then, of course, there's uh, little uh, information on the financial condition of properties that's widely available for 
kind of doing a systemic analysis of the financial condition of properties in the program. And then of course, there's the exit risk, right? And the tax credit program has some features that can specifically contribute to exit risk. Uh, the most obvious one, obviously, is um, the limited duration of use restrictions. So at some point, uh, the rent restrictions and the eligibility restrictions will expire, right? Um, and for properties before 1990, that was uh, after 15 years for the federal minimum. And then for properties in 1990 and later, there's a 30-year federal minimum, uh, which consists of a 15-year compliance period and then a 15-year extended use period. And of course, some states require and incentivize longer periods through QAP policies, like here in Washington, I think, goes out to 37 years. Um, and of course, there's also something called the qualified contract loophole. And this essentially allows owners uh, to request a qualified contract after 14 years of service, in which the finance agency has to find a buyer who's willing to purchase the property and operate it uh, as affordable housing in the long term over a one year within a one year period, otherwise the owner is then permitted to wind down the restrictions over a three year period. And then of course, this is further complicated uh, by the fact that some states either incentivize or require the waiver of a qualified right to a qualified contract. And of course, as we probably all already know, there are no tenant protection vouchers uh, in, in the light tech program like there are in other federal programs like project-based section eight. So I'm just going to summarize a little bit of what we know based on the academic research that's been done on uh, preservation risk factors. Really, most of our knowledge about this comes from research that was done on early year properties that were reaching year 15. And the pattern there was that um, a lot of the properties seem to be cited in weaker markets so that um, depreciation really appears to be the most significant long term uh, threat to the viability of properties and specifically a need for major capital improvements. In terms of exit risk, uh, uh, most properties appear to remain quote unquote modestly priced even after use restrictions expire. And that kind of makes sense when you think about the markets that they're located in, right? So there's a recent Freddie Mac study that's that argued or show demonstrated really that the the most properties remain affordable to households at 60% AMI, even after exiting program restrictions, right? So generally the way they refer to that is that they remain to workforce housing. So another, another thing we know from the research, although the research is very limited, generally speaking on this topic, that nonprofit ownership and actually re rehabilitation needs kind of almost paradoxically appear to be protective factors for exit risk. And it's also important that we understand ownership changes that are occurring around year 15 in order to understand how the property is going to be operated in the long term. Because as we know, there are often ownership changes in that, right? Um, so given the research today, right, um, is exit risk still an issue in the tax credit program if the, the housing seems to remain affordable generally at 60% AMI or generally what we call workforce housing? I'd argue that we have to think a little bit more carefully about that. So most of the research that we have to date about light tech preservation actually predates the HERA mandated data collection on tenants, right? And that's really critical when you consider that half of the tenants are at 30% AMI or below, and they have a median income of about just $18,000 nationally, right? And none of the research has really looked at preservation from the perspective of the outcomes for tenants. We've looked at the units, but not the tenants. So it's one thing for a property to remain affordable at 60% AI, but that doesn't tell us much about what's happened to the tenants. And we know the tenants, generally speaking, are much lower income than that. Or we know that now, right? Because in 2008, we had HERA, and then there was the tenant data collection that was mandated. And I think that really changed a lot of people's understanding of what's actually going on in the program. And who the program serving? It's doing something really important, right? Um, so now, obviously, I, I so I, I'd submit that risk, um, exit risk, is something we still need to take pretty seriously, right? And so we do a lot of work still around uh, doing a national and also more localized estimates about uh, LIHTC exit risks, 
And there are a couple of very important data sources to rely on to do that. Um, the first and most important is HUD's LIDTAC database, which was developed in the mid 90s. And it really what the LIDTAC, HUD's LIDTAC database is, it's a snapshot of properties when they were placed in service. And essentially they're not really updated over time to reflect changes in the property characteristics until the property exits the program and then it's reported to HUD as being non-programmatic. And I've already refer, referenced this, but another very important uh, federal data source, I would argue, in order to understand light tech preservation, that is the HUD light tech tenant data, right, which was mandated by HERA. And that actually, so now if you're not already aware, HUD is collecting household level data on tenant characteristics and then publishing that data in uh, state level uh, summary tables. So <clears throat> I mentioned this at the outset. One of the things I work on at the National Low Income Housing Coalition is something called the National Housing Preservation Database. And we do that work in all of our preservation research in conjunction in conjunction with the uh, public, and his, public, and his, public and Affordable Housing Corporation, uh, which is based out of Connecticut. And what the National Housing Preservation Database lets us do is it lets us look at a range of risk factors for any federally assisted uh, property, right? And a, the most important thing it provides is a fully deduplicated inventory of project-based federally assisted housing. And what we do to create the database is we take all of these disparate uh, federal subsidy data sources, right? from USDA, HUD, and the IRA, well, really just HUD for the light tech data. So we take all the, you know, for project-based section eight, public housing, the rural uh, USDA RD programs, tax credits, and we take all those, that subsidy data, and we deduplicate it at the property level. So you can see for any given property that's federally assisted, exactly what subsidies are associated with it. And then various, uh, variables associated with those subsidies, um, most importantly, including, or one of the more important things we include would be the end date of the use restrictions on subsidies. So if, for example, you have like a tax credit property that also has project-based Section 8 contract, you can see when the latest end date for use restrictions are for that property, right? That's the basic gist of what the, the database does. And it was also actually, as a side note, very important uh, tool uh, during the CARES Act moratorium, because the federal government doesn't actually have an inventory of its own assisted housing that was actually covered by the moratorium. So we were able to use that to help people identify uh, properties where, or even properties where uh, the eviction, the CARES Act eviction moratorium was in effect. Um, so like I said, it's a very important uh, tool for um, essentially deduplicating subsidies, right? And um, it's this whole deduplication thing sounds kind of boring, but it's really important because actually 40% of uh, federally assisted homes rely on funding from multiple subsidy programs. So there's extensive layering going on. You have to be able to untangle that to determine exit risks, or at least even begin to determine exit risks, because it's a little more complicated than that. <clears throat> So in terms of expiring use restrictions in the tax credit program, uh, we produced a report in 2021 uh, using the National Housing Preservation, Preservation Database called the Picture of Preservation. And we produce this report every few years and we update estimates for all the different federal subsidy programs about different preservation risks. And in that report, we estimated as many as 3,131 tax credit properties, which amount to about 166,000 units, reached the end of their use restrictions within the next five years. And this is a very high estimate, right? And I'm gonna get into why this is a lot more complicated in a second. Um, in that same report, we also estimated that over 100,000 tax credit units have been lost prematurely to the qualified contract loophole since 1990. And that's uh, pretty in line with other estimates that folks like NCSHA have done. And obviously I think we can all see why that would be a cause for concern. Um, and as I briefly alluded to just now, there are significant challenges with producing these estimates. Um, with regards to the expiring use restrictions, uh, we can really only account for properties that are subject to the federal 
uh, for minimum 30 years, or those in states, right, where there's a, a threshold requirement in the QAP for a longer uh, affordability set of affordability restrictions past the federal minimum. What we can't account for are uh, voluntary incentives at the property level, where a property is opted into through some sort of QAP incentive for affordability periods that are past the federal minimum. Um, and another kind of issue here is because the HUD database is, uh, it's, it's essentially a database of properties placed in service to snapshot, we don't actually have updated information on ownership over time. That information is very often outdated. Obviously, as I referenced earlier, it's important to understand ownership type as a risk factor. Um, and then with regards to the qualified contract waivers, uh, this data is simply not collected by HUD. So it's not in the HUD database and it can't be in the preservation database. So really currently we're constrained to only looking retroactively. So what's been lost, right, from the stock? We can't really try to estimate how many properties might be subject to a qualified contract, the qualified contract. So, you know, even if we're just considering exit risk, there are serious obstacles for quantifying LIHTC preservation issues using the federal data that's available. In essence, we're missing key property level indicators for exit risk, including uh, restriction end dates, uh, the presence of QC waivers, and then current information on property ownership type. And these challenges really raise some, I think, important questions. So the first is, you know, are housing finance agencies filling in these data gaps at the state level? And do the HFAs face challenge collecting these data and reporting them to HUD? We've heard this anecdotally from people we know at housing finance agencies, but also directly from HUD. When we ask them, well, why don't you have information on qualified contract waivers? Well, apparently it's very difficult, according to HUD, for HFAs to collect this information and report it to them. Um, and then also uh, another question this raises is the extent to which uh, state and local preservation stakeholders can access these key preservation indicators to identify uh, specific properties that are at risk in their communities and also develop a broader understanding of preservation risks across the community. And uh, a major kind of uh, audience for this is actually um, legal aid attorneys who are very interested in uh, tenant rights in these properties. So um, with all that said, uh, our ex own experience with data limitations uh, in the preservation database and a growing concern amongst our partners uh, led to us doing a, a report pretty recently. The report's called Improving Low-Income Housing Tax Credit Data for Preservation. And we actually haven't released it yet. It's coming out on Thursday, but I'm gonna kind of provide a brief overview for you right now of what's in the report. So as I said earlier, um, we engaged in a couple of research. We tried to answer a couple of research questions with this report. Um, first is what property level data HVA is maintaining and making publicly available? Um, and of course, what challenges are HFAs facing in maintaining and disseminating property level light tech uh, data? And then, you know, in, in cases where they're able to maintain and publish robust property level data beyond what HUD makes available, what enables them to do that? What can they share with other housing finance agencies that might be helpful in that regard? So the project really consisted of two phases of data collection. The first phase was simply a, a scan of websites, right? We looked at all uh, HFA websites in the 50 states in DC, and we checked for property level LIHTC data, the variables that were level available, and of course, also the format of the data, which is important if you're trying to make data machine readable. And then the second phase of the research, we conducted structured interviews with staff uh, from housing finance agencies who work with tax credit data. Um, and we interviewed staff from 25 different HFAs representing every census region, um, more rural states, more urban states, large states, small states, a very solid cross-section of agencies, I would say. And these interviews centered around a formal interview instrument that focused on both catalysts and challenges for LIHTC data practices. And then we conducted a thematic analysis of the responses we solicited through the interviews. 
So what, what data are maintained and made publicly available by agencies? Well, about 51% of, or 51 of the 55 housing finance agencies or 93% of them in the website scan posted some form of property level data on their website, right? And you can see that over on the right, um, the, the chart on the right shows you the format of that data. So most commonly the data was either in a, like a PDF format or it was an Excel file covering multiple years of data, which is, I would say, preferable because it's machine, much more readily machine readable. And about 36% of HFAs posting property level data provided as far back as the earliest years of the program. So 1987 and 1989, 10% provided data going back to 1990. And then about 20% had data going back to 2000. And about 26% had data going back to only about 2010. And about 8% of the HFAs in this scan uh, didn't uh, specify the vintage or the year that their uh, data, years that their data presented. So which uh, variables are actually available online to any member of the public? Uh, well, mostly basic variables like property name, unit count, and address. And um, key property level preservation indicators are typically not posted online. So over in the chart on the right, you can see that about 7% of them posted property, publicly posted information on qualified contract waivers and then about 16% on uh, subsidy status, 18% provided a subsidy end date, and then about 29% doing a bit better provided the owner type. So how are these data maintained and are they available? So in order to answer that, we had to dig down on uh, some of the key preservation indicators I mentioned earlier in our interviews with the 25 HFAs. And the vast majority report actually maintaining these data on restriction end dates and ownership. And about half of them maintained QC waiver data, um, but that might not always be relevant, right? Um, they might not maintain it because a very long time ago, they just eliminated the qualified contract loophole through their QIP. Um, and generally speaking, more HFAs report making these uh, preservation indicators available by request than actually post them online. So then we also had this thematic analysis that I mentioned. So we independently coded each of the interviews that we did for themes, and then we compared our coding notes to develop kind of overarching themes from the interviews that kind of provided insights into the catalysts and challenges that HFAs have with their LIHTC data practices. Really five main themes emerged from the analysis. Uh, the first theme uh, was uh, agency culture in relation to data, which is basically uh, you know, the extent in, to which HFAs are engaging in data-driven decision-making or the agency's uh, general culture around data really. And there's uh, the other main theme, I'd say the largest theme of all of them, the thing that was talked about absolutely the most was data management technology and processes. And obviously I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and then we also heard a lot about staffing issues um, and how that impacted their data collection and dissemination efforts. And of course, we also heard about relationships. A lot of agencies have uh, solid partnerships or relationships with the wider community that are letting them uh, either uh, collect the data more effectively or disseminate them often through like a, a third party, like a university or something like that. And then of course, um, another major theme are statutory and regulatory requirements and how those impacted their uh, light tech data efforts. So what were the general takeaways? Well, most, uh, most HVAs obviously post some form of property level data, but it's not always in a format that's necessarily practical to analyze. And the vast majority of HFAs don't publicly post key preservation indicators such as restriction end dates, QC waivers, or updated ownership information. And the other, I think this is the more interesting finding here is that the, the data often appear to be, LIHTC data often appear to be siloed across teams or systems within the agencies, which makes it really difficult to develop a centralized property level database that you could easy, easily report to HUD with or just respond to data requests from the community. 
right? I think a lot of the a lot of the time, what's happening is um, HVAs are very limited in staff, right? And so they don't have a database like this. And then when there's a record request, people have to go around and they try to piece together the information about a property from applications, which is really time consuming, I think. Um, and obviously, like I just said, it makes it challenging to report to, uh, to HUD, right? Um, and this, the agencies really do appear to be understaffed and under-resourced in many cases. Uh, there are some agencies that explicitly told us they were not and they had adequate resources. So I don't want to make a universal statement about that. But I'd say generally speaking, people, folks agreed to the idea that there's a need to in, invest in improving the quality and availability of light tech data through investments in staff and technology. And I think some of the states that do this really, really well, um, Oregon would probably be a really good example of this. There are places where the state legislature is specifically allocated money to improve these data and develop like a light tech database because it's, it's very time consuming, it requires a lot of staff time and uh, sometimes also technology upgrades. Um, and another really important thing that we heard about was a need for greater enforcement power to improve the data collection. Um, and this was, uh, HVA told us this is particularly an issue for properties after the tax credit period, um, when it's, there, there are very few kind of uh, sticks or carrots you have, right, for getting a, a property owner to comply other than, I suppose, the future threat of not getting a tax credit allocation, right? And that's particularly an issue because it's around this time that you get um, changes in uh, ownership, right? That's really important data to be collecting. So overall, what are the recommendations? Um, in terms of our data specific recommendations, uh, we, we, we think Congress should provide greater investment in HVA staff and technology to better streamline, automate and centralize property level light tech data. We also think ideally, you know, an ideal world, right? Uh, property owners, HFAs and HUD, and maybe even the IRS could adopt a singular platform or set of uniform set of standards for data collection and management software, which really ease the administrative burden on everyone, probably across the board and improve the quality of the data substantially. Another uh, recommendation we have, and this one is a little bit niche, but we think the federal government should adopt a national property ID for federally assisted housing. So that in each of their data sets, there's a unique property ID for a subsidy. And that would allow HFAs on their own without us through the NHPD, right? Um, to deduplicate subsidies on their own portfolio and easily match that, for example, to state subsidies. Um, we also think Congress should explore ways to grant more explicit oversight and enforcement powers to collect program data. Uh, for um, HVAs and HUD, although I'd say to me, it's still not clear what, what that would actually look like. I think that's a really difficult problem. And of course, finally, some general preservation recommendations. And most of these were in, I would say, build back better. So one, expand resources for preservation through the low-income housing expansion of the low-income housing tax credit. National Housing Trust Fund. I would also include public housing and housing choice vouchers in that though. Uh, I think you know some recent research suggests that RAD deals are actually increasingly gobbling up tax credits. So if we're investing in public housing preservation through the public housing program, that would actually probably free up more tax credits for tax credit preservation deals. And of course, I mentioned this earlier, the, the vouchers are, are really important to deeply targeting tax credit properties. And of course, um, there's a need to close the qualified contract loophole. I think that's a pretty much a no brainer. And then also to correct the statutory price to reflect fair market value when an HFA seeks a buyer during the QC process. And then we've been hearing a lot more about this lately. I think there's a growing kind of uh, consensus around the need to strengthen the right of first refusal because there seem to be some high profile cases where you have investors who are acting more aggressively in the in the deal and not exiting when they normally would be. Um, so that's it in terms of what I had to share and I'm ready to answer any questions folks might have. Yes. My question focuses more on uh, the more data that we collect. Yes. Uh, that we make public. Right. 
more likely we are enticing our predatory lending growth by Boston National. Sure. To close our, because we're basically setting up our Facebook for them and saying, these are the ones you want. Sure. I so that's a there there seems to be two ways of thinking about this. And I appreciate both points of view. Uh your view that you just expressed is also it's pretty common view, right? And the idea is that well, we shouldn't be helping them by providing them free access to this data. And I I I I very much appreciate that. I think the other view though is that you know the owners already have this information, right? And I don't in my view, it's probably pretty easy, easy for somebody like Boston National, who has a lot of resources, right, to hire some like a data scientist and figure this out pretty quickly, or just cold call a lot of properties. So I think from our view, my, my colleagues and I view, I think we kind of view this as um, making the data publicly available as a way of kind of like leveling the playing field, because the owners already have this information. but. Tenants very often don't even know they're living in a tax credit property, it turns out. <laughs> or, you know, people, it's, it might be hard for somebody who's, you know, um, a developer who wants to do preservation deals to identify at risk properties in a systematic way, certainly out of their own state, right? So I think, yeah, it's a difficult question. Uh, and I appreciate both sides of it. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's a, it's almost kind of a moral question. <laughs> so I, if you, did, if you did your last your last bullet point, it would make my question almost moot. It's not that I have a problem with producing. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Having that data. Yeah. But I also. Right. There, there may be a way to cut. Wait. I have a question. I I think that's much more common. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> In their city, there are like tech properties that have expired. They're going to have all of a sudden 100 pound hands full of public sales on the street where they're going to get technical problems with that information. You know, they're going to get it under the head of the phone. So I just wanted to. No, that's very helpful. Thank you. Any other? Yeah, I was going to add, you know, like, clarity to your point, like, um, other states like Oregon, for example, like, we've got more liberal disclosure rules around the popular data here in Washington. So, like, Oregon, for example, if you go to Park View or you start researching into that stuff, um, because of Oregon laws, you can't get into that specific ownership info without, you know, having to pay any report or not or something like that. Level data, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> but I think that's still a, it's a significant. Con I I still take that concern really seriously, right? I don't think it's something you do lightly. Just putting all the information out there. <laughs> Sure. Private market uh, most of the time it's tax credits, really. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Yeah, to yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's a re an article by Kirk McClure and Alex Schwartz that came out last year, around the time we were working on Build Back Better, about specifically looking, estimating at the use of tax credits over time 
through rad and it's substantial it's like 26 percent of them or something like that over a decade if the if rad continues to expand like that so it's a bit of a mis misnomer and gao has done reports about this this whole misnomer that they're just leveraging private resources they really are kind of robbing peter to pay paul yeah <laughs> Which is not to diminish the need for reinvestment in public housing at all. I just think it's better if we do it directly through the public housing capital fund. Um, are there any that people that are going to be like sure so I would defer to Washington State for what's happening here. <laughs> um, but generally, we do with NHPD to a limited extent. When we can get, when we're able to work with an HFA, we do, and in a limited number of states, just off the top, my top of my head, I think it's like Florida, Nevada, Massachusetts, and a couple of others. We are able to actually pull in. Uh, state subsidies into the database and incorporate that, but it's pretty limited. So generally speaking, I think NHPD, as it currently is, is a, a good starting point for building a local or state preservation database. Okay. What are you looking at or what are your thoughts? This is not something I've worked extensively on. This is something that the National Housing Trust is really kind of spearheading. I think maybe also to maybe a lesser extent NCSHA. I'm not I'm not quite sure. But generally, you know, I'm I'm not totally honestly completely clear on the details on that yet. But I would I can give you um actually you should talk to Laura Abernathy at the National Housing Trust, and I can give you her contact information, and she can talk to you about that. I also, uh, we run a working group for our state partners at the Coalition on uh, Light Tech Tenant Protections, and we recently had some attorneys on from Minnesota who are actually in the middle of, like, litigating cases around this and working with, like, housing providers to kind of fend off of these, uh, these investors. So I could also connect you with them if that would be helpful in your case. Um, so what was the data set that you were trying to purchase? Ooh, I'm trying to think if we, what you would want there is a county a county FIPS code or a county GID. Yeah. So I believe we have that in NHPD. So you could take NHPD and you could match. You should be able to match at uh, HUD income limits to that. I think off the top of my head, I have to go <laughs> check. Um, but yeah, you're you're free to use it. Like I should have made this clear, NHPD is free. <laughs> it's a free resource. Uh, we do, uh, if, if it's a for-profit company that wants a data license, that's a little different, but for the vast majority of users, it's, you know, um, w w for government, uh, for like nonprofit housing developers and folks, researchers, tenants, it's free to use. And essentially, you know, we'll share data through a data license with a fee for like, for example, for like Freddie Mac, and we just use that to help at least somewhat offset the cost of running the database. But I'd be glad to talk to you about um, getting some data. Any other questions? Yes. So we haven't, we've only just now started looking at tenants and through some very, very kind of like exploratory qualitative research. It's 
extremely hard to find tenants who are in these properties after they've exited. And there are only a couple of, of cases that I can think of off the top of my head where we've been able to actually identify them. One was a property in Oregon. There's another one, I think Clovis, California. Uh, so that's something we're actively working on, but it's very, very early. <laughs> but hopefully we'd, we'd be able to identify enough properties where we can begin to maybe look at uh, differences like that. One, one way to do that maybe would be through a HUD data license um, uh, and looking at um, housing, choice voucher, uh, housing choice voucher holders who live in tax credit properties and seeing what happens to them when subsidies expire. That's actually another thing that I'm working on right now. Um, but that might be another way of getting at it. But generally, it's a very hard thing to figure out, at least quantitatively. Did a study this summer on trying to figure out why people are exiting low income housing on tax credit projects. It's hard because so much of the data is protected. Like, if we were trying to if we figure out if it's systemic racism or can we find it, if try to get at issues related to this, we just got that finished. Like, how is it gone? Oh, like, the okay. But if you're interested in it, it'll be available. I'm hoping to talk about it. Most certainly, yeah, definitely. I'll keep an eye out for that. And then, yes. Sure, yeah. 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 And one of the, I, I didn't, I try not to get into too much anecdotal stuff, but I think one of the kind of the, we worked quite a bit with people in Oregon, actually, somebody named Rob Prash. And then my former colleague, Megan Bolton, is at the HFA there. And she's kind of done a lot of work around improving their preservation data there. So, no, you know, one of the cases that I became familiar with very early on was this property, a senior property in Oregon that came to the end of its use restrictions. And there had been seniors, it was a senior property, right? And there had been people who had been on a wait list a year before to get into the property. And they didn't know that the subsidy was gonna expire in the property, right? So they come in, they think they've got everything sorted out and <laughs> it's, it's, it's sad, but you know, I don't know how, it's hard to even say how common something like that is because it's so limited what we can say through the federal data sets. Okay. I think I've said what I need to say. If, uh, anybody else has any other questions now? I'm ready for some breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Dan. Yes. Oh, yes. I remember you, Katie. How's it going? I couldn't.